This presentation will cover the concept of perfusion. The exemplars that we'll cover here are DVT, or deep venous thrombosis, and PE, pulmonary embolism. Phlebitis, or sometimes called thrombophlebitis, is a condition in which a blood clot forms and blocks one or more veins. Clots typically form in the legs, but can form in other areas of the body, including the arms and neck in rare instances. When the blockage occurs near the skin surface, it's known as superficial thrombophlebitis. When it occurs deep in a muscle, it is known as deep venous thrombosis or DVT. DVT typically occurs in the large veins of the lower leg and thigh. Let's address the pathophysiology of DVTs. Three pathologic factors called Virchow's triad are associated with the formation of a thrombus or clot. And those include circulatory stasis, vascular damage, and hypercoagulability. It is vascular damage that stimulates the clotting cascade. Remember, the clotting cascades, the clotting factors, occur in the liver. Platelets aggregate at the site of the trauma, particularly when circulatory stasis is present. Platelets and fibrin form the initial clot. Red blood cells can become trapped in the fibrin meshwork and the thrombus grows in the direction of the blood flow. And this triggers the inflammatory response causing tenderness, swelling, and erythema or redness in the area of the thrombus. The thrombus initially floats within the vein. Pieces of the clot may break loose and travel through the circulation as an embolus. And in this slide, you, in the diagram, you'll see those three factors involved in Virchow's triad. What we are talking about in terms of circulatory stasis, for example, um, immobility. How many patients in the hospital are immobile or on bed rest? Um, venous obstruction. A lot of times pregnancy um, can act as an obstruction to venous blood flow. So can tumors and obesity. Then circulatory stasis is also um, caused by varicose veins when the blood flow is sluggish or um, doesn't continue to move forward. And then there are certain cardiac conditions and arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation um, can lead to circulatory stasis as well. And so those are the big ones there. Under vascular damage, again, we have a whole host of things that can lead to this factor. Um, including cellulitis, atherosclerosis, even an indwelling catheter, IV catheter, um, a heart valve, and vena punctures, and any type of physical trauma, strain or injury can lead to vascular damage. And blood coagulation, that hypercoagulability that we mentioned as a factor in Virchow triad, um, many things can lead to um, increased coagulability, including major surgery and trauma, uh, even malignancy. Uh, also, it can be inherited as a thrombophilia and infection and sepsis, inflammatory bowel disease. I mean, it just goes on and on. There's so many things, um, including inflammation and autoimmune disorders. So many things can lead to these various pathologic factors that are associated with thrombus formation, which you see in the middle of the diagram as a venous thrombosis or embolus. Okay, continuing on with the pathophysiology, we see that deep venous thrombi occur in the deep veins of the body that lead to the vena cava. 
The deep veins of the legs, primarily in the calves and of the pelvis, provide the most hospitable environment for venous thrombosis formation. There are also deep veins in the arms, chest, and neck, but thrombi typically do not form in these locations, although they can. Approximately one half of DVTs are asymptomatic. If symptoms are present, they depend on the clot's location and the size of the clot. Let's talk about the etiology of DVTs. Um, this is what can cause them. Thrombi can be either venous or arterial. Venous thrombi tend to occur at sites where the vein is normal, but blood flow is low. Arterial thrombi tend to occur at the sites of arterial plaque rupture. DVT is a common complication of hospitalized patients and patients who have had surgery or are immobilized. Other factors associated with venous thrombosis include venous injury, um, cancer, pregnancy, oral contraceptive use, or hormone replacement use, clotting disorders, obesity, and history of DVT, whether it's personal or family history. And we also see on this list, not to forget, smoking certainly is a cause uh, that can result in DVTs. Oh, risk factors continues here. First, let's state that risk factors are conditions that can predispose individuals to DVT. And they are simply that, risk factors, okay? Just because you have a risk factor doesn't mean you will develop a DVT. Individual preventive approaches minimize the risk factors that can predispose people to DVTs. Specific conditions warranting prevention include things like atrial fibrillation, orthopedic procedures like orthopedic surgery, especially has a high risk of DVTs. Um, as we say, atrial fibrillation with the heart because that these patients will form blood clots within the atria and then these blood clots can be dislodged and circulate in the circulation. Um, this can lead to strokes or it can lead to difficulty breathing in terms of a pulmonary embolus. Other things, acute MI or myocardial infarctions, patients who have had an acute MI have a high incidence of DVT. Also, ischemic stroke. Estimates of DVT incidence following an ischemic stroke vary greatly, but the majority of studies do suggest that DVTs occur in about 20% of patients um, who've had a stroke. It may even be higher than that. In many cases, prophylactic anticoagulant therapy is prescribed to lower the risk of DVT. Other preventive measures include elevating the foot of the bed with the knees slightly flexed, which will promote venous return. Also, early mobilization leg exercises after surgery or injury or illness, and certainly another preventive um, intervention would include medical compression stockings and our um, pneumatic compression devices. Again, these are intermittent compression devices, and these people sh or patients should be wearing um, compression stockings and their pneumatic compression devices if they have limited mobility, certainly if they are um, on bed rest for any length of time. Many patients with DVTs experience no symptoms of, at all. Therefore, we call them asymptomatic. When symptoms are present, they may differ greatly in severity. The signs and symptoms of DVT are primarily caused by the inflammatory process that accompanies the thrombus. An aching pain in the affected extremity, especially when walking, 
is the most common symptom. A dull or tight feeling in the calf is also common. Tenderness, swelling, warmth, and erythema may be noted along the course of the involved veins. The affected extremity is often edematous and may be cyanotic. In rare cases, a cord may be palpated over the affected vein. The major um, complications of DVT are recurrent DVT and PE. PE occurs when the clot break or fragments of the clot break loose from the vein wall. As the clot travels, it moves through progressively larger veins and into the right side of the heart. From there, it enters the pulmonary circulation where it eventually occludes arterial blood flow to a portion of the lungs. This results in a mismatch between ventilation and perfusion in the portion of the lung that is affected. Note that everything distal to the clot will not be perfused and that area becomes ischemic and infarcted. So we can have a pulmonary infarct as a result of a pulmonary embolism. Uh, the effect on gas exchange really depends on the size of the embolism and also the size of the vessel that is occluded. Laboratory studies that may be ordered include a D-dimer, the PT and PTT, activated partial plasma time, and bleeding time and platelet count. Diagnostic tests also include a duplex venous ultrasonography, which is a non-invasive test used to visualize the vein and measure the velocity of blood flow in the veins. Although the clot often cannot be visualized directly, its presence can be inferred by an inability to compress the vein during the examination. An MRI is another non-invasive test for detecting DVTs. It's particularly useful when the blood clot of the vena is in the vena cava or the pelvic veins. Uh, another, actually the most accurate diagnostic tool for venous thrombosis is a contrast venography. So this would be the gold standard for detecting venous thrombosis. However, it is invasive and it is expensive and uncomfortable. So it is not used very often, but only if we need it to um, confirm or to diagnose because the less invasive tests have not clarified the diagnosis. Prophylaxis or prevention of the formation of blood clots is going to be a main focus for us as nurses in the hospital. Um, anticoagulants that prevent clot propagation and enable the body's own lytic system or enzymes to dissolve clots are the mainstay of treatment for venous thrombosis. Thrombolytic drugs such as streptokinase or TPA may accelerate the process of clot lysis and prevent damage to the venous valves. Thrombolytic therapy may be recommended to dissolve a blood clot. Okay, for most patients though with DVT, anticoagulation is initiated with unfractionated heparin, although low molecular weight heparins may also be used. Following an initial intravenous bolus of unfractionated heparin, additional units are infused over a 24 hour period. The, decision, the dosage is calculated to maintain the APTT at approximately twice the control or normal value. For this reason, it is important for you to know your normal values for your PT and PTT. And um, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say right there. 
So knowing that for it to prevent or be therapeutic in preventing the formation of DVTs, you want to maintain that APTT at approximately twice the normal value. Frequent monitoring of infusion is an important nursing responsibility. Subcutaneous heparin injections may be used as an alternative to IV infusion in some instances. And sometimes oral anticoagulation with Coumadin may be initiated at the same time as the heparin therapy. Overlapping heparin and warfarin therapy for four to five days is important because the full anticoagulant effect of Coumadin is delayed. Warfarin doses are adjusted to maintain an INR greater than 2.0. Other preventive measures include elevating the foot of the bed. The knee should only be slightly flexed, okay? Early mobilization, so many complications can be avoided or prevented simply by having a patient ambulate. So never underestimate the value of mobilizing your patient as soon as possible. Uh, leg exercises, including flexing um, and pointing, circulating the ankles. It can be passive and active range of motion as well. And we already mentioned the intermittent pneumatic compression devices and elastic stockings. All of these help to promote right-sided return um, blood of blood flow. Whoops. Okay, when a patient is diagnosed with a DVT, they are going to be admitted to the hospital and there's going to be a stat order for IV heparin. Okay, this is going to be very important. Um, we want to get their heparin infused as quickly as possible. Remember what heparin does. It prevents the clot from getting larger and it prevents the development of new clots. Okay, so we don't need to, we don't not give heparin to eliminate the clot. What's going to break down that patient's clot? Their own lytic system, their own enzymes will break down that clot. Okay, so we got to get the heparin on board and it may be at the same time we're starting them on Coumadin, oral pills. And I, we just explained why it's important to start them about the same time because this patient is going to go home from the hospital in a few days and they're going to be given oral anticoagulant to take at home, the Coumadin. But it takes the Coumadin four to five days to become fully effective. And so that's why we have to start that their treatment in the hospital so that when they go home, they're no longer receiving the IV heparin, but they are taking the oral Coumadin at home. Okay. Uh, generally, they're going to continue taking that Coumadin for at least three months. When the DVT recurs or risk factors such as altered coagulability or cancer are present, anticoagulant therapy may be longer than those three months. Regular follow-up is necessary to be sure that the INR remains within the desirable range for anticoagulation. Okay, remember when you're on Coumadin, we measure the PT and the INR, okay? When the patient is on heparin, we measure the PTT. Um, the PTT uh, normally is approximately, you may memorize a different normal range, but I like 20 to 45 seconds. Now, if a PTT is prolonged, which will occur with heparin administration, that means it's going to take longer for their bodies to form clot. Okay? It's prolonged. That's therapeutic. That's what we want. We want the therapeutic level to be between one and a half to two and a half times greater than 20 to 45 seconds. Okay? So that's when it's therapeutic, is when it's at least twice, close to twice the normal PTT.
In most hospitals, the physician is going to order a weight-based heparin protocol. And so you'll have um, this policy will be in your policy manual. And also you will have instructions of how to enact this protocol uh, because we will be adjusting the dosage of the heparin. We adjust it based on the patient's PTT value. Okay, for example, I just showed you um, a partial, uh, a part of the protocol here. It's based on the patient's weight. So you need to have the patient's weight to begin with, okay, in kilograms. And when the PTT value comes back, you're gonna look at that value and this protocol will then tell you what you need to do to make the adjustment on the heparin that you are infusing. Um, if straight here, let's say it's less than 35, then that means that it's less than 1.2 times the control. And if you go straight across, you'll see that the instructions are for you as the nurse to bolus 80 units per kilogram, and then follow that with a drip of four units per kilogram per hour. Okay, so this is where it does become very important that you know how to do math. Okay, you need to be able to figure out 80 units per kilogram so that you can adjust your drip. And that would be for the bolus. And then after that, you're going to continue infusing the heparin, but at a different rate. And that, again, will require a calculation. So you'll see on the left side what the PTT comes back as. And then on the right side, what you need to do to titrate the dosage for your patient to keep them in the therapeutic range. Okay, so you wanna make sure you give them enough heparin that they stay in the therapeutic range. We don't want them to form a bigger clot or new clots. It appears that I'm a little bit ahead in my speaking. Um, so let's look at, a little closer at our warfarin. Again, we said warfarin is Coumadin and we need to overlap it with the IV heparin for four to five days. It does take five days for the full effects of the warfarin to kick in. We want to, even after that, we monitor the PT because we may need to make dose adjustments as well. But this we need to, the Coumadin needs to be adjusted to maintain an INR of greater than 2.0. Remember, a normal INR without any anticoagulant is 1.0. So we want the INR or the international ratio to be greater than 2.0. And we want to maintain that dose to prevent recurrent clot formation. We said at least three months, perhaps even longer, depending on the patient's history and what's going on with them. And again, regular follow-up, get that PT drawn, and let's see if we're still in the therapeutic uh, dose. Um, we can also use low molecular weight heparins as well. Um, there's a benefit to that, to using a low molecular weight heparins. They are more effective than Coumadin and there's lower risk of bleeding, okay? And also they don't require that close laboratory monitoring. If they're using a low molecular weight heparin, they don't need to go to the lab and have their PT drawn. Okay. Also, we can administer it subcutaneously in fixed doses. So we know exactly how much. We don't have to worry about titrating it. We give them a fixed dose and for whatever is appropriate for that patient, both in the hospital and outside um, the hospital. There are newer categories of anticoagulants as well. And we see some on this diagram here. First, I wanna point your attention to the novel new oral direct factor 10A inhibitors. They're listed there, apaxaban, vitraxaban. Okay, so they end in ban, that will give us an idea that they are a factor 10A inhibitor. Remember where 10A was in our pathways, in the liver with our coagulation factors. 
we had both the intrinsic and the extrinsic cascades going on, but they came together at a common point right there with factor 10 and factor 10A. So now we have a whole nother classification of anticoagulants that works right here at the common part of the cascades. Okay, so factor 10A inhibitors disrupt the coagulation cascade by directly impairing factor 10A function. They prevent, they're useful in the prevention and treatment of DVTs. They reduce the risk of formation of clots. They help um, to prevent clots forming in patients who have strokes and who have AFib. It is just as effective as warfarin with several advantages. One thing, it can be administered by mouth, which is good. Uh, it has a lower risk of interaction for, with food and other drugs. We cannot say the same thing about warfarin. Okay, there is a lot of interaction with certain foods and other drugs with warfarin. Another big advantage of these factor 10A inhibitors is that there's no need for frequent INR monitoring. Rapid discontinuation um, without substitutes, uh, substitution of another anticoagulant may lead to serious ischemic events. Okay, so the factor 10A inhibitors are not risk-free. Although these drugs should not be used in patients who are undergoing anesthesia or spinal puncture because they can increase the risk of long-term paralysis due to epidural or spinal hematoma. Okay, so there is a serious risk of ischemic events when they are discontinued suddenly if you do not also substitute some other anticoagulant in its place. So here um, you can click on this link and go to this resource for um, another uh, drug um, protocol, uh, which could help you to get uh, familiar with these different drugs. Another pharmacologic therapy are the um, direct thrombin inhibitors. They are advantageous in that they inactivate both free and bound thrombin. However, um, the FDA currently limits the use of these drugs to a few specific situations. Uh, in particular, Argatraban is given to patients undergoing percutaneous coronary interventions. Remember PCIs, we talked about that, as well as patients at risk for thrombocytopenia related to heparin therapy. Okay. The, big, the Bigatron is given to patients with AFib. Okay, so there are different uses. We can see here with the direct thrombin inhibitors with this particular example, the Bigatron, it, where it has its effect in our liver associated with our intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. Okay. DVT is typically treated with conservative measures and anticoagulation. In some cases, however, surgery is required to remove the thrombus, prevent its extension into deep veins, or prevent the effects of embolization. That means where it breaks off and travels to another uh, part of the body. Venous thrombectomy is done when the thrombi lodge in the femoral vein and their removal is necessary to prevent PEs or gangrene. Successful thrombus removal rapidly improves venous circulation. The duration of this effect varies from patient to patient. When DVT is recurrent and anticoagulant therapy is contraindicated, a filter may be inserted into the vena cava to capture emboli from the pelvis and lower extremities, preventing pulmonary emboli. Several different filters are available. The Greenfield filter is widely used for its ability to trap emboli within its apex while maintaining patency of the vena cava. 
The filter can be inserted under fluoroscopy with local anesthesia. Mortality and morbidity associated with the filter are very low. Many students will ask me, what happens to all those emboli that are trapped in the apex of that filter? Aren't they going to obstruct blood flow? No, they do not. Blood flow can continue to go through. So tell me, you, with all that you know already, what is going to happen to those blood clots that are trapped in that filter? What's going to break them down? Yes, the patient's own lytic system or enzymes will break down that clot. Okay. Now, superficial thrombophlebitis of the great saphenous vein in the leg can progress to DVT. It may be treated by ligating, tying it off, and dividing the vein where it joins the femoral vein to prevent the clot from extending into the deep venous system. Superficial thrombophlebitis that involves infection can lead to septic venous thrombosis. When this occurs, the affected vein is excised to control infection. And so it can be surgically removed. Yes, we can surgically remove veins. Um, and then antibiotic therapy would be um, initiated. Okay, let's now talk about some non-pharmacologic therapy. Treatment of venous thrombosis also includes measures to relieve symptoms and reduce inflammation. With superficial venous thrombosis, applying a warm, moist compress over the affected vein, resting the extremity, and using anti-inflammatory agents typically provides relief of symptoms. Bed rest may be ordered for patients with DVT. The duration of bed rest typically is determined by the extent of the leg edema. The legs are elevated 15 to 20 degrees with the knees slightly flexed above the level of the heart to promote venous return and discourage venous pooling. When allowed, walking is encouraged, as is avoiding prolonged standing or sitting. Crossing the legs also is avoided, as are tight-fitting garments or stockings that bind. Before I talk about some lifestyle, lifespan considerations, let me mention this safety alert that your book points out so importantly, that any stockings or pneumatic compression devices are contraindicated if the patient already has a DVT. They are used for prevention of DVTs, but once the patient has a DVT, then we will avoid any type of pneumatic compression device or type stockings. Okay. While DVTs can occur in patients of all ages, um, DVT is rare in children. Okay. Um, certain conditions like prematurity and sepsis can predispose newborns to DVTs. The risk for DVTs increases in adolescents and young adults by eight times greater than we find in infants and young children. Although the risk is still relatively low for this group, uh, adolescents and young adults, it's still lower for them than the general population. During adolescence and young adulthood, thrombosis is twice as likely to occur in female patients than in male patients. Okay. Uh, one factor that places young women at greater risk is the use of contraceptives containing estrogen and progestin, often called combined hormonal contraception. Use of combined oral contraception, birth control pills, increases the risk of thrombosis three to four times. Um, although other combined contraceptive methods can increase risk as well. During pregnancy and the first few weeks of the postnatal period, a woman's risk of DVT and PE 
are four to five times higher than that of women of the same age who is not pregnant. Okay, and if the um, woman it has an inherited clotting disorder, that will further increase the risk. Um, Pregnancy-related changes to the body increase the risk of developing DVTs in this population of women. Um, the treatment is heparin. Heparin is the preferred anticoagulant for women who are pregnant that have DVTs. It is the preferred treatment because it does not cross the placenta. The same cannot be said about Coumadin, which does cross the placenta, and on top of that has teratogenic effects. Age is a real risk factor for DVT, and the risk for thrombosis increases 30-fold between the ages of 30 and 80. Fatality rates related to VTE are also higher in older adults than in younger age groups. Okay, in addition to being an independent risk factor, age is associated with the development of other risk factors, including venous stasis and conditions that limit mobility. Uh, and in addition to that, there's cancer and cancer therapies, which are also important risk factors among older adults. DVT um, is commonly asymptomatic in older adults. When the symptoms occur, they are nonspecific. Um, a patient's known comorbidities may have symptoms in common with DVTs, complicating the diagnosis. Age-related body changes can lead to false positives on their D-dimer tests. Anticoagulant therapy is commonly used to treat older adults with DVT, but older adults are at a higher risk of bleeding complications, and they have a higher risk of falls. Multiple comorbidities decrease kidney function, decrease body weight, dementia, and increased risk of falls all complicate the use of anticoagulant therapy in older adults. Prevention of venous thrombosis is an important component of nursing care for all at-risk patients. To promote venous blood flow from the lower extremities, the nurse should position patients with the feet elevated and the knees slightly bent. Avoid placing pillows under the knees and positioning patients with hips and knees sharply flexed. Use a recliner chair or footstool when patients are sitting. Ambulate patients as soon as possible and maintain a regular schedule of ambulation throughout the day. Teach ankle flexion and extension exercises and frequently remind patients to perform these exercises. Apply compression stockings and pneumatic compression devices when appropriate. Instruct patients to avoid crossing their legs when laying in bed or sitting. Okay. And as we see here, we want to inquire about possible prophylactic heparin or warfarin, warfarin therapy for patients undergoing orthopedic surgery or other high-risk procedures. Frequently assess their IV sites, change the site and catheter as dictated by agency protocol, and if there's any evidence of local inflammation. So let's go on and talk about the nursing process, beginning with assessment. The nurse should assess patients at risk for a venous thrombosis for signs and symptoms and risk factors and obtain objective and subjective data. Observation and patient interview. Review your personal and family history of DVT, PE, and clotting disorders. Discuss any recent surgical procedures or traumatic injuries. Note complaints of leg or calf pain, duration and characteristics of pain, and the effect of the pain on the patient's ability to walk. 
review their current medications, discuss exercise and regular physical activities, observe for shortness of breath, cough or chest pain, as these may be the signs that an embolus has moved to the lungs. Okay, there's more to assessment. We now need to do the physical examination. Assess vital signs, including temperature. Examine the affected extremity for redness and warmth. Assess for tenderness, particularly in the calf and the medial thigh. Palpate the extremity and note any cord-like structures. Note the presence of edema and whether it is unilateral or bilateral. You can measure the diameter of the affected extremity. Observe for calf pain or the Homan sign when the foot is dorsiflexed. Nursing diagnoses that apply to the patient with a DVT include the following, acute pain, ineffective protection, impaired physical mobility, risk for ineffective peripheral tissue perfusion. Okay, so once they have a DVT though, it's no longer risk for then they may have ineffective peripheral tissue perfusion. Okay, before they're diagnosed, they may be at risk for. Planning for the patient with DVT, um, it means making goals. Goals may include that the patient will, remember goals always begin with the words, the patient will. For example, if they have pain, acute pain as a di nursing diagnosis, a good goal would be that the patient will experience pain control, sufficient to allow rest, sufficient to allow comfort, or sufficient to allow mobilization if it was preventing them from walking. Another goal would be that the patient will have no complications from embolization of the thrombus. In other words, the goal would be to not have that clot dislodge and travel to the brain or the lungs. Okay? And certainly, because this affects tissue perfusion, um, a goal may be that the patient will have adequate tissue perfusion and then you would have to select the findings that you would be looking for that suggest that there is adequate perfusion. The next step in the nursing process is implementation. For our patients with DVT, the pain associated with it results from inflammation of the involved vein. It may be aggravated by the use of the involved extremity. Edema and swelling may contribute to discomfort. So measures to reduce the inflammation often help relieve the pain. The nurse should do things like assess pain location, characteristics, and their pain level using a standardized pain scale. You should also um, report increasing pain or changes in pain location or characteristics. What if the patient now develops pain in the chest? That is something to report, a very serious finding to report. Sudden chest pain may indicate a pulmonary embolus, necessitating immediate intervention and therefore it's called an emergency. Other things you can do, measure the calf and the thigh diameter depending where the, the clot is located. Apply warm, moist heat and maintain bed rest as ordered. 